Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Rose Longhurst. I use she, her pronouns, and I am so excited to introduce this session on innovations in philanthropic practice. So we know Audrey Lord taught us that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, and yet it seems to me like we keep throwing the same shit at the same walls and hoping that this time, this is gonna be the time, some of it will stick. I feel like we, we need more imagination. It, we, the multiple interconnected systemic crises that we face are not going to be tackled by business as usual, particularly when we know that business is one of the reasons that we have many of these, these crises. And we, we need more. We, we can't be using the same tools, the same ideas, the same approaches. Uh, it's just a lack of imagination. And one of the things that I was thinking about in particular is in my work in democracy, I, in my day job, I work on democracy. And so often that means to people, elections, politicians, political parties, and obviously in the UK, like actual parties, but let's move on from that. I would love it if my work meant that instead of thinking about those things, we were thinking about the incredible alternative forms of democracy that have existed for a really long time and are continuing to blossom all over the world. And also the ways that everyday democracy takes place in our, in our daily lives, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities. And this is, the sort of, this is the sort of reimagining of democracy that I think it's so hard for people to do because we've always been told democracy is about voting. We just need more people to vote. We just need better politicians. No, I think we need a better democracy or at least looking at what already exists out there that's working and is putting the agency for creating the decisions that affect people's lives into the hands of the people that are affected by those decisions. Uh, so yeah, less alter attention is given to the alternative systems of democracy. And I think we need to ask ourselves, why would we think that the same things are going to produce different results? And so when I was helping to set up the Edge Fund and Fund Action, we questioned everything, which as you can imagine was like super exhausting. But I think that this then resulted in models that really offered, uh, offered us a different way of being with one another, as well as ending up funding different things and, and doing different stuff. So for example, at Fund Action, instead of asking people to volunteer for tasks, which obviously, a lot of, you end up with a lot of the same people doing, doing the volunteering. We use a process called sortition where we would choose people, uh, randomly select people by lot and then ask them if they would like to participate and take part. And the Edge Fund was the first activist collected, uh, collective that I'd ever been involved with that paid people for their participation. And obviously this was to recognize that, you know, it's only just to, to compensate people for their time, but also that if you don't, it can set up a barrier to participation for, for certain types of people. And, you know, now it seems quite obvious that we would compensate people for their time. And that if you're going to ask someone to speak at an event or organize something for you, or you're just gonna pick their brains for hours on end and get them to write you reports, you should compensate them. But at the time when we asked for that, it was considered to be absolutely wild. And I think, you know, these, these organizations, they're still, they're still iterating. Edge has been around for 10 years and is still reviewing the way that we do things and questioning and trying to do better. And Fund Action is not resting on its laurels and after five years has done a participatory impact evaluation and is changing a lot on the basis of that. And I think that there's so much that we can learn about the fact that we need to keep interrogating our assumptions, we need to keep iterating, and we need, really need to innovate and experiment. And so that brings me to today's panel. So I'm so excited to hear from all of our panelists who will be doing a show and tell of how they're doing things differently. Uh, this session we'll be hearing about innovations in philanthropic practice, the ways, methods, and approaches that we might need to use to fund things differently and, and therefore get the, the results that we need to tackle these systemic and complex challenges. I'll each, introduce each of them in turn very briefly before each of them speaks and we'll have three guests on the screen as well as the four that we have in person here. So it's my pleasure to start with Imi from Civic Square who is here to talk about the practice of funding systemic experimentation. Over to you Imi. Um, Cassie asked me to uh, do a more general introduction to this uh, this this topic, and um, 
And I feel a bit like a fraud, if I'm honest. There's incredible people across in the audience who are doing work in this space so beautifully, uh, notwithstanding Rowan and the, uh, the, the work that they're, they're doing and uh, Julio in the back of, of, uh, of this, the audience that we've learned so much from about how you build portfolios of change. Um, and but I guess I'm going to just talk from a, a perspective of literally a young person that grew up uh, doing projects maybe out of a small fund into maturing into this this whole thing that we're now doing and, and talk a little bit about what I think the role of, of funders in philanthropy can be in that. Uh, and I'm going to go through the layer of a social social challenge. And the reason why I'm going to go through the layer of a social challenge is because I feel like, very honestly, for the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time showing what could be possible with a beautiful, diverse, young um, uh, population in Birmingham, young at heart, not just necessarily young of, of age, um, and showing really what could be possible, how much people at the heart of their places with the right agency, the tools, the resources, the creativity, when they come together, they are the best place to, um, to show what could be possible. And when we stop infantilizing them, they are really able to engage with deep, uh, knotty systems from land to finance to uh, what I'm going to talk about in a second. And I feel like in those 10 years we've done a lot of describing the problem I'm talking about myself um, we've described what the problem is with the land system we've described the knotty challenges in all of these spaces we've shown what's possible in small lovely um, moments but Actually, if we're going to get serious um, about the scale of the challenge we face, the amount of time we have to do something transformational, and the number of people and types of skills and knowledge systems and uh, parts of the system that are going to have to come together, I think it's important to really rethink what the role of ph philanthropy can be in that. And the role of philanthropy in that, in my opinion, isn't that it can fund it to make it happen, because the scale of money required for challenges like this is nowhere near the scale of money you had even if you all banded together and made some like wartime effort to say, let's go towards this, you would literally just touch the sides. And you tell us this often yourselves. So what happens then? Does that mean we just give up and just say, hey, well, we can't do that. So we'll keep doing great stuff, right? But yeah, we know it's not going far enough. We know the challenges are more systemic and knotty and we know we need transformation. And we know transformation isn't always just the things that we can all collectively agree on. The lowest common denominator of what we agree the next step should be it can't just be incremental. Um, and we know that the scale of what's happening in the world and in, that is coming in our country, we're not necessarily being honest about. And, um, and here's an example, right? In my city of Birmingham, we need to retrofit two out of three homes by 2041. This is a serious amount of houses. This is a serious number of people. Across the whole of Europe, you have to retrofit 6,000 homes every hour to hit the 2030 decarbonisation targets. So every time you miss it, you're, ta you're, you're, you're tapping on. And we're, you don't need me to tell you, this is all happening at glacial pace. These are the sorts of challenges that aren't just about cavity wall insulation or a small thing uh, that is a technocratic change to your house. They are knotty and complicated and they are to do with issues of trust, of connectivity, of reframing of the lack of materials, the lack of supply chains, the lack of local skills. They're interconnected with health. They're interconnected with the climate crisis. And here's just a, a system map from Dark Matter Labs showing the scale of challenge. And then when you've got everything everything, you've got the money, you've got the trust, you've got all sorts of things. People still are like, hey, what is this? I've never even, I don't even know why I need to have this done. Simultaneously, all the things that I know many funders talk about in, in this room and is incredibly important is making sure their work reaches, reaches those most, most uh, harmed and most oppressed and most marginalized and most struggling in these challenges. And ha the house is a site for that to absolutely come, uh, come to life. We had Kwajo uh, Tweawembe yesterday at our Retrofit Reimagined um, Festival and he talked about the houses that he had gone into that were cockroach infested, that were falling, ceilings were falling down, that we were, we were talking about a scale of poor, low quality, underperforming housing in this country that is not just, hey, we need to retrofit, but is criminal. Right? And we all know that we're not able to get even into, into a, a corner of this. And then you start to talk about these sorts of challenges with the philanthropic sector, and they're like, we, we can't because look, look, right? What are we meant to do there? 
And so this is a great uh, diagram by a colleague called Calvin that shows uh, you can't, we can share the slides so you can see the detail. It doesn't really show up well on here, but it shows the impacts of underperforming housing. It shows what it is on health, on literacy levels, on learning levels, on um, community, on um, all sorts of things from asthma to there's just tons of things there and how they cascade out and how one set of challenges turns to another and turns to another. And before you know it, you've got all these people across society paying for it and desperately trying to scramble. So at this point, it is fair to say philanthrop philanthropy doesn't have enough money. How do we, how do we move? But there is a whole new class of people that have started to, so I'm looking on the left at the moment as the big government schemes and the big ways in which a lot of uh, these programs are being um, like, you know, talked about. We can, we can ins insulate your home. We've got one-off grants. They're extractive. They rely on the same market logics and so on and so on. And we know this. So simultaneously, you've got all of you talking about this bold, rich, just, uh, democratic, uh, socially just, equitable world. And then we've got a system out there having to, uh, and in many ways, working completely in, in opposite of that. And we've got this shared space that we're all really interested in, which is, hey, people having safer homes that are healing, that are, you heard from Fazana from Amari yesterday, the home is the heart of um, how we understand our lives. It becomes the streets. We understood this in the pandemic. Um, from what had the best of the pandemic, it sounds like an awful sentence to say, was the mutual aid, was how we came together, was how we were able to build transformative movements uh, from that. And so why I wanted to just share this is that when, you, when you're talking about those scales of, of challenges, you can kind of say, hey, it's not for us. We haven't got enough money. What can we, we do about it? But actually, that's absolutely where the um, philanthropic sector needs to come in because you've got a whole new class of organisations. It's not just Civic Square. You've got Centric Labs, your Dark Matter Labs, your Healing Justice Londons, your Open Systems Lab, people who have stuck with it, who have grown up, who have gone, no, we're going to actually tackle these knotty challenges and we're not just going to do it in a technocratic way. We understand the social, the political, the, so the equity, the social justice, the participation, and we've been doing tons of this in Birmingham. And there's a whole project that I would have shared that would have taken me ages, but I'm not going to. But I wanted to say, in order then for you to think about how you start to fund um, this sort of transformative work, it is needing to look at where the field is matured, where it's working in ecologies, when it's working beyond itself, when it's working across spaces, across talents, across skills. You need to be able to fund that at a large scale over the long term in the most liberatory way possible. You have to fund the ecology around it. It has to be generous. And when I say generous, I literally mean you should be funding double the operating budget. Because what you do when you fund double the operating budget, say I need a million a year, and you say take two million a year and keep one million at, at, at the bottom, what that allows is emergence. Because as you discover the next step, you can actually step into it, not go, I'll get back to you once I've talked to, I don't know, who can I see, Lan Kelly Chase, about whether they can get me that in a year, right? Um, and this means that you have to think very differently about how you fund because your role isn't to be able to try and find the money to tackle these multi-billion pound challenges. Your role is to fund the demonstrators as quickly as possible and in the fields where it's already emerging and, and going really amazingly, creatively, equitably, on the ground with many partners. And so why I wanted to share that is that I really am kind of sick of this binary of we can do this or we can't do this. There is a space for philanthropy to set up, uh, step up and accelerate demonstrators, accelerate systemic exper experimentation, do it generously over the long term in liberatory ways and understand large scale. I mean, large scale to me will be very different to yours, to people who've got a billion pound endowments, you know, a couple of million a year to transform how things could happen is not, is not that large scale. But we need to start to be able to step in and take the challenges that we have really, really seriously and know that our role in how we can accelerate demonstrating what is possible is a very valid and important role to play so we can start to shift. Because from my perspective, now being in this world I never expected to be in with the local authority and all sorts, they are crying out for, show us it's possible. Show us this other, more equitable, participatory, creative, joyful, street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood way it's possible. And we can go further. So that's where the role, I think, of philanthropy can come into this and start to accelerate those demonstrators and really make the possible plausible quickly.
Thank you so much, Jimmy. I wonder how many of us are funding emergence. Uh, we're going to move on to Chris now, who should be appearing above me. Fantastic, thank you. So Chris from The Circle is going to share their practices and principles they use for the ethical stewardship of resources. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Jem. Wake and awake, everyone. Um, I'm joining you from my home in what's known as British Columbia in Canada. It's 3.30 in the morning, almost 4 a.m. in the morning. This is how excited I am for this audience um, and for the conversations. Um, I don't join you um, lightly. I don't join you because I don't have other opportunities to speak or present, but, but because I was so moved by the opportunity to learn alongside the other folks on this panel about the ways in which they're transforming the philanthropic sector and their work. And so thank you first to Amy and then to the folks who follow. So um, my name is Chris Archie. I'm the CEO for a national member-based organization. And I'm very fortunate to be um, in deep relationship and an unbroken relationship to my traditional territories in Sequim de um, in 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 Canada. In the context of Canada, Indigenous peoples um, continue to exist. We do um, have deep relationship to our land, and I feel very fortunate that I get to bring those worldviews and practices into the work that we do at the Circle. That ultimately, um, we are a member-based organization that serves two primary audiences, the first being Indigenous grassroots organizations, movements, nations, as well as Indigenous-led charitable organizations. The second member audience would be what we call the settler philanthropic sector. So organizations like community, corporate, family, and private foundations whose wealth has been built on the land and on the resources and on the backs of Indigenous peoples in this country uh, historically and in present day through harmful um, investment and extractive resource practices. I have a slightly different view related to this notion of philanthropy that I want to share, which is that first and foremost, when most folks talk about philanthropy, what they're actually talking about is a few hundred year old practice of charitable behavior that actually benefits the rich, um, you know, and behaves in a, in a charitable way. Uh, but it's not actually focused on equity. It's not actually focused on justice. I am really fortunate to exist in a world where my understanding of generosity, of reciprocity, and the teachings I have about hoarding and greed enable me to imagine that philanthropy is more than just a few hundred years old, that in fact it is a multi-generational practice of deep and ethical stewardship of resources and a redistribution of wealth. I have teachings and laws, as do many of the nations in our country here, um, who continue to practice um, these laws and these teachings. And so in the Canadian context, when we talk about this work, we talk about and differentiate between Indigenous philanthropy as something that has been around for a heck of a lot longer uh, and that we know a heck of a lot more about how to ethically steward the resources from our territories, but also how to share, how to redistribute that wealth um, and to be in a different quality of intergenerational relationship and accountability to it. So I wanted to give that framing because I do believe that is a very different framing um, than probably this audience is used to hearing. That being said, um, I also want to share some slides. So just give me a moment to do this magical thing. Ta-da, you can see the slides I gather. So what I wanna do is to share with you this beautiful image here. Um, this is an image that we use to talk about um, our organization and the behavior. What you might see here is a pretty picture with some salmon and a bear and a sun and you know trees and water. But actually, um, this particular image was used to create a story that we shared about the journey of salmon and how the journey of salmon can provide a, a touch point and a metaphor and opportunity for leadership and transformation in the sector uh, by inviting people to go on a personal journey for change. In addition to that, what we see when we when I look at this image is a um, connection to place um, in real deep relationship to both living, 
um, to living beings and also a recognition that living systems are what are required for transformational change in this work. So some of the principles we enact in our work are represented in this I image. Um, we recognize that uh, part of our work is to not have all the answers. In fact, part of our work is to be in a space of unknowing. And we pride ourselves as an organization to be one that has more questions than answer questions than answers for folks, because actually answering the questions is a required part of um, undoing white supremacist thinking. It's a it's an important part of undoing um, the thinking that leads us to doing the same old, same old. We also believe deeply that we are wiser when we act together. It's important for us to make our learning visible, as well as we are really serious about being deeply invitational in our work. We do our work alongside those who show up to do the work. I don't waste my time trying to convince people of the value of our work. I don't waste my time trying to educate people who don't understand the basic nuance of the injustice that is experienced by Indigenous peoples in this country. Um, and that we actively center ind Indigenous wisdom to help transform this system while actively decentering whiteness in the work that we do. And ultimately, we believe that folks need to have an embodied experience of the future, of a future that we could collectively be proud of. Um, and so much of our work is focused on how we bring our whole selves into this work, because if we can't do that, we're not going to transform the way in which this uh, philanthropic sector behaves. So what I'm sharing now is a framework for a year-long shared learning journey that we do with settler philanthropic organizations. It starts down in the bottom right in wintertime uh, with tending the roots, um, moving into tending the soil, up to tending the communal fire, and we end in fall with tending the harvest. This particular um, I, it's not a training, this particular um, program is called Partners in Reciprocity, and it's meant for settler philanthropic organizations to have an opportunity to learn alongside one another while also practicing personal leadership qualities of courage, renewal, kinship, and integration in order to tackle the kinds of um, systemic principles and practices inside of their institutionalized philanthropic organizations to alleviate um, the pressures and to actually make them do better in their relationship alongside Indigenous organizations. We use a seasonal pathway because it's a living system, um, but also because it is part of both our governance and our operational um, behavior as an organization. So what all does this mean? Ultimately, it leads to um, shared data collection that we at, as an Indigenous-led organization make use of to um, actually support our narrative building and our ability to drive knowledge and data for change in the sector that is predominantly led by um, white saviors and or by folks who think they know better. Um, and so even that alone, being able to hold the pen on this writing is an important piece of work that we're able to do as we work to transform um, a national philanthropic landscape. And just the last pink thing that I will share is that many organizations are now looking to us to make use of what we call the I4DM, the definitional matrix, which actually invites some clarity about understanding the difference between whether a settler philanthropic organization is funding an, or, uh, an Indigenous-led organization um, or just funding an Indigenous benefiting organization. And so we're happy to share this with folks so you can take a look. Uh, we are clearly fans of having abundant funding going to Indigenous-led solutions for change and for transformation, rather than um, funds going to benefit Indigenous peoples. This is a frame that we know other equity-seeking communities um, are keen to make use of, and we're happy to share it with you. These are the kinds of principles and practices um, that can change the thinking and doing in the traditional philanthropic landscape when led by those of us who have experienced marginalization at the hands of um, ingest philanthropic behavior. So with that, I'm done here, and Kukshem, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris.
lovely notes on generosity and reciprocity there. And I think we're going to be able to share all the slides, so don't worry too much if there was so much there you couldn't gather, because we're going to move on to our next person now. We've got Pia um, on how the Open Collective is becoming an operating system for communities to collaborate and compensate their members and is growing an infrastructure for a new economy where the community is at the centre. Thank you, Pia. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, what an amazing couple of days uh, it has been. Um, so Open Collective, like our approach to philanthropy is essentially inverting the hierarchy. We want, um, what we want to see is a world where everyone is a funder and not just funders are giving money to projects and then projects are like saying thank you, reporting back, but the projects themselves, the collectives are doing the philanthropy. Our goal is to spread wealth globally while rooting it in, a hype, in hyper local communities. And so what we do at the core is we enable grassroots communities to be sustainable by providing them with a financial mechanism and an open uh, finances platform in order to be sustainable, to receive money, crucially, without becoming something that they are not. Right? So what happens today is that in order for collectives, movements, grassroots um, organizations to receive funding, they need a business bank account. Right? Because funders, companies, donors need to send the money somewhere that is a corporate bank account, whether that's for profit, non-profit, it doesn't matter, but it has to be an organizational bank account. And so they need a legal entity. Most of these groups do not want to become a legal entity. They don't want hierarchical structures. They don't want vertical structures. They might not be even operating in the same territory. Right? So we're forcing circles to become triangles. So what Open Collective does is we let them be circles. We are obsessed with moving money from the center to the fringes. And that's what we do. We find creative ways of enabling communities to be sustainable. And we do this with a, a two-part solution. The first part is um, an open source platform called Open Collective. Everything is called Open and Collective. That is my fault. I am sorry. I should have thought of this before. I didn't. Six years down the track, here we are. <laughs> so Open Collective is a platform that gives communities, groups, a minimal organizational structure. It's a gateway payment. It lets them have a transparent ledger. It lets them manage their money, pay their members, um, receive invoices, etc. Like, but the other part of the solution is a pot where they can put the money, right? Because at the end of the day, in the world that we have today, someone needs to connect to the legacy system. Someone needs to report on this money, needs to be receiving this money in a bank. And so what we created is a network, a global network of 300 plus nonprofit entities that their sole role is to receive money for these groups and enable them to operate. So we receive the money from the funders or corporations or organizations or individual donors. We take care of the compliance, tax reporting, everything that is boring, right? That has to do with accountants and lawyers. And we let communities do what they're supposed to be doing, right? Then we let them just do their thing and focus on their impact. Crucially, everything is project-directed funding, as in collective-directed funding, co-funding. We don't get like into the, you should be doing this with this money. That's not what we're talking about here. We're giving you money. You decide how you spend it. We just do the compliance side of it, right? So this is the operating system. Um, and so how might this type of funding be efficient? We use Open Collective's platform in order to um, provide a very lightweight solution for these communities. It's also mission driven. We're furiously mission driven. We provide what is called fiscal hosting as a service. So you're a collective, you need to receive money. In the day, you're up and running, you're able to receive money. We take care of compliance, we take care of tax deductible receipts. We have you, like, we've got your back, right? You do not have to worry about that. Um, and we do this by bringing in hundreds of um, nonprofits around the world. But we're also democratic, and this is exit to community. I'll talk about this in a second. So this is our approach, is um, a, a purpose-driven startup, which is Open Collective Inc. Now, Open Collective Inc. is, we needed to create a startup because we needed to attract um, risk-friendly capital in, or, in order to build this technology in a way that it was um, competitive, right? Um, 
we also needed to do it in an open source way, right? Everything that we do is open source. So all our technology is open source. Folks collaborate from all over the world. Um, and we, 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 we build this technology with the mutual aid, the solidarity economy, right? So we work with hundreds of mutual aid groups um, and social movements that help us build this uh, technology that is done by Open Collective. But the technology that will be owned by the community that it serves. I think that today we all agree it's, we can't have this situation where the platforms that communities are using to sustain themselves are owned by investors or founders like myself. That can't happen anymore. The technology that communities use, the infrastructure for the commons must be owned by the commons. So how do we do this? We're doing this by exiting Open Collective to the community. So Open Collective, the platform, the company, will be transferred to a perpetual purpose trust that is gonna be democratically managed by the community. So it was very difficult for us to build the tech that we build with non-profit money. It was very difficult because it's, it's impossible to do technology at the scale that we do with non-profit money. And so we built a startup, we have capital from investors, but we are now turning around, we're moving those shares into a trust that is managed by the community, we're paying back our investors, and then we're entering into a revenue share model with the community that owns the technology that it uses to sustain itself. So Open Collective at the core is a constellation of it's a mess, it's a beautiful mess. It's a 30 plus, um, sorry, that's, there's a zero missing, 300 plus nonprofits, LLC and co-ops around the world, um, social impact fiscal sponsors that support 15,000 groups. And last year we raised $30 million through, op through Open Collective. These collectives raised for themselves $35 million. We are already at that number um, this time in 2022. So this is money that is moving from the center to the fringes. Uh, we're doing very, very creative ways to distribute money with a technology that is, will be owned by the community that it serves. So when you think about philanthropy today, when you think about decentralized philanthropy, what, what, you, what you need to, um, to think of is it's a multiplicity of, of systems and actors and entities. So we, it doesn't have to be just a nonprofit. It doesn't have to be just a startup. It doesn't have to be a fund, a foundation. It's all of this together. But above everything, it's unincorporated groups. It's groups that are not registered. Those are the groups that are doing the work that we want to support. Those are the groups that are at the front lines of the change that we need to see. And so we need to find ways of funding them without forcing them to be something that they're, they're not. And that's what we're trying to do with Open Collective. That's it. <laughs> Um, I got a note to say that I think Emmy and Pia both need to leave. I know you've got a flight to catch. So can we thank them both for their contributions today? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. I'm really looking forward to learning more about Open Collective because I feel like um, and I think Roxanne was the person mentioning this yesterday. We think about civil society so often as being these sort of very formalized, professionalized NGOs. And then, you know, we moan about the fact that there's so many formalized, professionalized NGOs, but then that's the only ones that we fund and the only ones that we think about when we talk about civil society. And yet organizations like Open Collective were allowing very, very different types of uh, groups and uh, social change to happen through, through the communities and collectives. But one of the things we um, need to talk about now is the way that, uh, the, well, we're going to hear from um, Sadaf from the Firelight Foundation on the different ways they've created systems and processes that show how professionalization can be a barrier to transformative change. There's a nice link there. So over to you on Sadaf. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope the sound is clear. Yeah, we can. Um, so 
Great, thank you. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Sadov Shalwani and I'm the Director of Programs and Learning at Firelight Foundation. I'm so honored uh, to be here with all of you. It's just such, it's just such an amazing panel and for the portions of the conference I've been able to join in, um, just really amazing to see how philanthropy is being reimagined and rebuilt um, to be, to actually disrupt some of these power structures um, and be more uh, enabling. So as, um, Firelight, uh, Firelight as an organization is committed to community-driven systems change in Eastern and Southern Africa, and I'll share more about this, but in a nutshell, community-driven systems change for us is about supporting community leaders and community organizations to continue to be resilient and responsive agents of change in their communities, uh, being able to mobilize community ownership and action to address systems and root causes underlying the key issues that they're facing. Uh, Firelight is a multi-donor public charity fund. That means that we primarily do our work by raising funds from major foundations, family foundations, philanthropists, and so on in order to fulfill our work. And that affects some of what we have and haven't been able to do um, in our changes. Um, you know, in terms of the problem setting, I'm not going to um, dive into it much because I think we've been talking about it quite a bit um, in this conference. But I think one thing I just wanted to highlight is Firelight had our own process of learning where um, over a three-year process, and in many ways this learning continues even now, um, we consolidated a lot of insights from our community-based partners and community leaders um, and advisors around how change actually happens in the community, how local organizations and civil society actually affect long-term and systemic change, and how Global North philanthropy <coughs> excuse me, has traditionally um, undermined and harmed civil society and community systems um, in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, as has been shared previously in this conference, that these Global North, traditional Global North philanthropy practices have tended to perpetuate white supremacy, charity mindset, neocolonialism, um, uh, and race, racism. Um, and so we're starting to challenge uh, for Firelight uh, to challenge ourselves to do things differently. Um, and this is where maybe we can start my slides. So what Firelight has been doing differently based on this, um, you know, many multi-year learning journey with partners is we have started taking a solidarity-based uh, approach to partnership, as well as, as I talked about, community-driven systems change. For us, solidarity has been about a trust and allyship-based approach to grant making and partnership, in which we are continuously unpacking and redefining power dynamics, whose agenda and priorities get funded, which solutions are supported, how change actually happens, and how funders can be enabling partners rather than um, directors or, or um, sort of um, uh, bosses in the process. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, how we define professionals and how we think about impact and effectiveness and efficiency um, and how um, system systemic inequity can be understood, disrupted um, and redressed. Um, so the second piece in, more, in terms of how more specifically we operate and for that we can move to the next slide. Um, is around community-driven systems change. So this approach for us was not developed somewhere in an office in North America. It was uh, developed with our partner communities, with our partner community-based grantees, uh, in consultation with um, community-based advisors through a three-year learning journey, which in many ways is still ongoing. Um, it, it was a learning process, as I mentioned, in which we were really challenged by our partners uh, and community advisors to unpack and redefine what success means, what impact means, what sustainability and effectiveness mean. Um, so through this whole process, uh, what we came to was this approach that we have termed community-driven system change. And it's an approach that really values and emphasizes the insight and the leadership and the ownership of the people who are living with and experiencing the issues at hand at the community level and their work to create lasting change in the system and root causes that underlie those critical issues that they seek um, to address. We can go to the next slide. So some examples of how this has uh, resulted in us doing things differently. Um, you know, we've really shifted the way that we think about impact, uh, how we think about change measurement, how we think about professionalism and organizational effectiveness, how we think about efficiency and grant making practices. And I'll give a few quick examples from these um, because I know that we are short on time. Um, so in terms of how we think about impact, I think we all know that Global North philanthropy has tended to define um, impact and effectiveness in terms of measurable results, sometimes reach and scale, and, sometimes, and often um, outcomes that are defined by the owner. 
We know that this privilege is what's easier to measure, not necessarily where change is more impactful. It also privileges well-resourced, usually white and global north-led INGOs who can uh, show reach and they can capture data. Usually also privileges short-lived results um, that are related to donor interests and agendas, not actually what the community um, wants and needs in the long term. What Firelight is doing is we're actually um, supporting and funding what is needed for long-term systems change. Um, and recognizing that many of those um, inputs and processes may not be measurable or tangible. For example, it might be about community capacity and agency. It might be about these um, you know, messy processes of stakeholder relationship building and engagement. It might be about uh, partnerships and collaborations. So we work with community organizations um, to uh, mobilize their own communities to define their own vision of what success and impact looks like, their own indicators of progress. Um, we provide long-term funding partnerships uh, including funded time at the beginning before a proposal is even developed so that communities and stakeholders can work together to unpack issues. Um, we support very participatory and community-driven learning and evaluation. So communities are themselves defining what to measure, how to measure, when to measure, if to measure, um, as well as qualitative learning inquiries. In terms of how change is measured in particular, uh, we recognize that evaluation and data uh, for us, it's not about judging the worthiness of an organization or even the worthiness of an intervention or an action. It's about creating opportunities for learning and reflection and adaptation. This means that we embrace more participatory and indigenous methods, we embrace qualitative methods, we embrace long-term inquiry and dialogue, and we embrace action research as valid and possibly even more valid sources of data uh, for learning about process as well as impact. Um, you know, in terms of professional professionalism and organizational effectiveness. Um, I think in general, a lot of what is unsaid in philanthropy and in development is um, about, you know, uh, professionalism tends to be defined as these characteristics that either make an organization or a person seem more trustworthy or credible to Global North funders, um, or characteristics and practices that are familiar and comfortable for Global North funders. But we know that professionalism is culturally defined, and we know that the, the characteristics that make an organization seem credible to a funder may not actually be the characteristics that make them credible and effective in their social change work. So what we've done is we've actually challenged ourselves to really redefine and unpack some of our own assumptions and biases around how we select organizations, for example, for funding. We have started moving towards focusing on legitimacy and credibility in the community, you know, who the community defines as their, you know, the civil society organizations that they um, uh, sort of appreciate and respect and um, work with, the relationships that they have with uh, government stakeholders, with um, the, the way in which they address equity and inclusion or, or are actually equi equitable and inclusive. Similarly, in terms of um, uh, organizations establishing partnerships with us, we have established systems so that we take on more of the burden and less of the burden is on our grantees in terms of um, uh, convincing us that they are uh, worthy or credible. So this looks like things like being more flexible and responsive in our grant making. For example, we don't require legal registration. We often accept handwritten proposals that are sent to us over WhatsApp. Um, so just trying to think about how we can really unpack and, and reimagine uh, what, are, what are the pieces that are really important for community-based organizations to create change, and what are the pieces that are like can absorb and adjust or let go of. Um, I think I'll stop there and encourage everyone, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you can, you know, slide after that, uh, you can actually capture more about our approach at um, our website on the next slide, community-driven systems change. Um, and I think the changes that we have seen in our own work is that, um, by shifting these things in small and large ways, uh, communities that we're working with are actually demonstrating transformative uh, power and agency. They are sitting at the table with INGOs, with funders, um, and, and pushing back and being able to speak to what their own community needs are. Um, our grantees, because they're less focused on reporting to donors, um, they're able to focus on the actual work that needs to happen. We are starting to see more equitable partnerships, although we still recognize the power dynamics. We're seeing more open and honest conversations where grantees are pushing back at us. Um, and they were always pushing back, but I think it's created even more space. Um, we, ha we are working really actively to make sure that CBOs and communities are in the room when there are development discussions happening with government, with funders, and so on. Um, and ultimately, what, we're, what we are hoping to see and what we are starting to see is that there are changes in the systems and root causes in the community that are actually uh, long-term, and they're owned and driven by community stakeholders, not by outsiders um, like Firelight. 
we can go to the next slide. Um, and that's just a link, I believe, if it's there. If it's not, uh, oh, that's okay. So you can go to the Firelight website um, and there should be a link there for community driven systems change if you wanted to. Just, we have a bunch of guidelines and tools that describe what we're doing and what we're learning. So um, you can always join in there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sadaf. And I'm really looking forward to hearing how you accept proposals by WhatsApp. I've never heard of that before. But now on to Louise, who will be sharing the work of stewarding loss on how funding good endings and closures is as important an aspect of transformative change. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for sticking with us. There's so much richness in all of this. Um, and I really want to start with a bit of a provocation. Um, a what if we valued endings just as much as we do beginnings? Knowing that endings are often the overlooked part of the cycle of change and the sort of ma magic missing ingredient of transformation that we're kind of a little bit afraid to get close to. I should say I'm a bit surprised that I'm here kind of talking about this. I've also kind of spent the last 10 years starting things up, been in that hamster wheel of two to three year project cycles, um, kind of just jumping to the next new shiny thing and not really grounding and kind of applying the learning and committing that through to the next thing. I've been through that cycle enough times to know that it's just exhausting. Um, and started to realize that we're collectively paying very little attention to the ends of things, but perhaps there's a lot of wisdom that we're missing by not doing that. In parallel, I've been holding this kind of fascination with death, which might sound a bit strange. I couldn't really explain it. A sort of fear for the future, but realizing that actually it's about um, unprocessed grief that goes through generations of my family that is kind of willing to come out. And then the pandemic happened. Um, the fear of catching COVID kind of forcing us into isolation, the fear of dying, the fear of the loss that's happened, the loss of our lifestyles that changed kind of overnight. And yet again, disproportionately affecting those who are already suffering from the inequalities that we have as well. Um, and the pandemic really has forced me to lean into kind of endings and loss as, as part of this as well. So I've been part of the stewarding loss team over the last year which was set up in about 2019 to re with the intention to really support civil society to dedicate as much time, energy, care and resources to endings as it does to beginnings. And in that time, we've been researching the state of endings. We've been creating resources and tools that are freely available for anyone to use who wants to really explore what this actually means in your context. We've hosted events and had a flood of people that have come that are really breaking the taboo of not talking about this and showing that there is a latent demand for actually creating space for more of this. We've experimented with setting up a careful closures fund. It had limited kind of um, uptake, but we think that's something about just not being able to speak about this. And one of the most interesting things has been around 40 very candid, gentle, tender conversations we've had with leaders around the place who are considering um, endings and wanting a safe space to test out options and strategies before they go and talk to their boards, before they go and talk to their funders, before they talk to their staff teams and not feeling like they had anywhere else to go. And more recently, um, we've been supporting both the Small Charities Coalition and Campaign Boot Camp to kind of close, to, to complete their final chapter and endings of their organisations. And I really recommend taking a look at the Campaign Boot Camp final report that was released earlier this week. It's a treasure trove of kind of insights and recommendations and a real honest perspective of what's difficult when you're running these ambitious projects and really working with diverse teams. Um, and some of the learnings that we're kind of taking from all of this as well. The first is about the messy, tumultuous decision-making process that comes with deciding to stop or end or close something. It's not neat, it can be drawn out, it can be complicated, um, but the relief of actually making a decision can be huge. Um, but it's not always an active choice. When it's not clear who decides who decides, then sometimes the ending can be done to you and you lose the agency that you have and the potential to make it a really beautiful thing. 
And the process of ending can be traumatic and it is emotional. There's a lot of burden on executive teams and leaders and community holders, uh, often trustees, to really hold and carry that. There's very limited structural support, but there's almost zero emotional support for those people that are kind of carrying this and we really need to shift that. And through all of this, we've learned that there's a really important role for funders in all of this to normalize, to invest in, and to tend to endings because of the gravitational pull that you all have in the kind of social change space that we're all a part of. And as we've heard over the last couple of days, we're actually starting to see endings as a really credible and strategic choice for financial organizations and funders. Um, spend out funds and foundations aren't new. We heard from 30 Percy yesterday about their spiral investment approach, spiraling out their investments so they can spiral up the impact that they can have in communities and um, creating wealth in the collective. Um, uh, yeah, we're seeing the sunset movement in the US being really alive and really vibrant. We've heard from the next generation of wealth holders that they want to shed actually what has been accumulated and really finding ways to let go of that. Um, and we heard this morning that actually is, is there a role, perhaps there should be a role for philanthropy making itself obsolete. That's going to require loss, it's going to require closure, it's going to require all of us to participate in that. And I've got a hunch that actually what sits underneath all of this and is actually at the root of all of this change is actually grief. We heard that from Laurence earlier, the unprocessed, unmet, uncared for grief that we all have and we all experience. I feel like it's the DNA of a lot of the foundations of the operating systems for the organizations that we're part of. Um, particularly true for family of the foundations, for those that have extra extractive pasts. Um, and I think a root of a lot of the tensions that we're all having to navigate through. But there's a whole separate talk on a whole nother day that, to go into that a bit further. Um, but in terms of why it's important, um, it's about being really resilient in a changing world. The pandemic is just a starter for the change and the discontinuity that we're going to experience over the coming decades. It's going to be the backdrop for the, the rest of our lives. And getting better at really navigating loss and endings is going to become a really core cool skill for us. The just transitions and the regenerative futures that we're all investing in aren't just shiny utopias, but inevitably it means a loss of an old way of doing things, ways of living, ways of relating, and somehow we're ignoring that part of the change that we're investing in. An investment in endings is an investment in the seeds and beginnings of the new system that we all want to create. Um, and too often, I think the thought of endings is actually worse than the reality. When done well, endings can be beautiful, they can be liberatory, they can be celebratory, and they really provide the wisdom and the seeds of the new system that is kind of already emerging around us. Um, Amy, who we heard from just now, and the example of them really intentionally closing the Impact Hub Birmingham is a great example. And the Civic Square project that's emerged from that, it shows you what's possible when actually you do, you do this with intention and you know when to stop. It can enable healthier cultures, um, not burning ourselves to the ground. It's about deep care and it's about kinship, it's about an active practice of decolonizing that we've heard is so important, and a contribution to a healthier, liberating cultures that is going to allow all of us to thrive and feel more alive. And you might be thinking this is all good in theory, but what does this actually mean for funders and investors? Um, I kind of road testing a couple of recommendations that we're, we're, we think is coming to bear. And we're going to be running an event in the autumn to kind of share more along with the testimony of some of the organizations that have closed more recently. So let me know if you want to know more. But the first thing is about really getting better at acknowledging and practicing all types of endings, be that leaving roles well, ending projects, ending programs, exiting, as we heard from here um, just now, um, and how you, yeah, how you end the kind of funding relationships. Don't just think about the endings at the end, but really upstream in how we work. The second is about being approachable for difficult and challenging conversations with grantees. A lack of um, humility and the fear of approaching a funders when things are going wrong um, is it, something we've heard time and time again. Listening with compassion can be the difference between an orderly or a disorderly traumatic ending. The third is about offering emergency funding to those that are choosing to end, providing the running costs for the last three to six months to ensure that the learning can be captured and the emotional support can be there for people. Um, 
and making sure that there isn't a cliff edge of learning, but actually the learning can be seeded into the new. The fourth is about really investing in an ecosystem for endings that's on a par with the startup ecosystem that is so alive and has so much money that is being um, thrown into it. And then finally, really investing in a culture of the, uh, that um, reframes loss and endings and the narratives that see it embedded and into our cultures and an inevitable part of our lives. Not ignored, not something to be in, afraid of, but actually really embraced. Um, what is it going to take to do all this? Luckily, it's not a new idea. This is just the way life happens. It's innate within us. We just have to trust the kind of natural forces. But it's going to take all of us getting better at acknowledging, talking about, practicing, investing in endings to make sure it happens. And I really think it's the most courageous kind of leadership choice and move that any of us can make right now. So much respect to those that are doing it and those of us that choose to go there too. Thank you so much, Louise, and I think it's fascinating because this is really a, um, uh, talking about grief and endings, it's really a taboo in this sector. So now we move on to Irene from Deep Science Ventures, who is here to talk about the practice of using collective intelligence and other kinds of intelligence in the design and practice of funding. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so hopeful to be here after all these conversations. Um, let me share my screen. Great. So, um, yes, um, I wanted to talk today about the uh, use of collective intelligence in grant making. And by collective intelligence, um, I mean an umbrella term that describes the ways that we harness uh, the intelligence of groups of people together with machines to mobilize a wider range of information and ideas. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in the, the wisdom aspects of that conversation, uh, which I define here as the insights and possibilities that emerge when people, um, people shared sensing, thinking, but also feeling and experience takes them beyond their individual perspectives into the long-term well-being um, of lives uh, of other communities, future generations, and the planet. So um, I will be sharing um, some work that I've done, but also really good work from from others, um, and I hope that some of the projects will inspire you and show you how collective intelligence can be used in grant making. So the first um, a way that it can be used is around centering the community's inherent assets, collective assets and capabilities, as a starting point for the search of solutions. And the approach here is called uh, big data positive deviance. Uh, the idea here is uh, positive deviance is the observation that in every population, there are individuals or communities who, despite the same uh, situation or challenges, they achieve better results than their peers. These can be farmers with better yields than their neighbors or parents who keep their children well nourished. Uh, when others are, uh, are not well fed. So if we focus on identifying those positive outliers, we can discover those unusual practices and strategies that we can successfully scale out and scale deep uh, to solve local problems. Uh, the twist here is that big, da big data can be used. Uh, big data here, I mean data from mobile phone records, or social media, or satellite images to identify those individuals. Um, for example, uh, we see here um, Farmers who achieve higher than expected cereal crop productivity in Niger or in Germany, uh, districts identified that can contain COVID uh, a lot faster. So this is a starting point that could take us from a top-down identification of, of problems and imposition of external solutions to, to much more local practices and strategies. Um, another way that collective intelligence can be used is around supporting grounded and embodied knowing. Uh, this project that I really like is called LITI. It uh, combines indigenous local knowledge with big climate data sets. So the starting premise is that there are many climate change impacts. Some of them are more, less visible and more complex as they interact with fragile ecosystems and local populations. Um, and humans who live in close contact of the, the natural environment, they have developed complex knowledge systems. They can observe subtle changes in the environment. They can witness uh, slower uh, effects. Um, Yet climate science, like the big climate models that we use to, to plan for adaptation, um, often overlooks that knowledge. So that project essentially has developed new methods to harness that knowledge, embed that qualitative embodied insight into the big uh, climate science models, which leads to both better research, but also better, better policy that reflects the local realities. Um, so this is, this, this is more of a provocation of how when we try to intervene in complex systems and we do use complex systems models, how can we include the lived experience of people in a very pragmatic and, and actionable way? 
Um, another way of using collective intelligence is to incentivize the pulling of ecosystem data and knowledge. And the project I wanted to highlight here is uh, Shubak. I'm also a Shubak fellow, so if you have any uh, people in the audience, um, shout out. Uh, so Shubak uh, sees the potential uh, for organizations to collaborate and share data, infrastructure, and skills to tackle climate change. So what they do is they select and fund and scale climate nonprofits that are tackling climate change through open source data. So building those open data uh, assets is a, is a core part of the work. And then Suba creates data cooperative uh, and makes sure that the data is discoverable, trusted, and more connected to both the people that are part of that ecosystem, but also everyone, everyone else around that. So I can see that as a, as a really interesting model that can be replicated in many other areas where we have lots of silo data, be it in the food system or modern slavery, and uh, you want to incentivize the ecosystem to share that knowledge more abundantly. Um, another way that I think, excuse me, collective intelligence can be used is to use the wisdom of the crowds and communities to predict uh, the future in different ways. Uh, this approach is called super forecasting. Uh, so super forecasting is a method that harnesses the predictive capacity of crowds. And it has been found that with the right incentives and training and, and groups of people can actually uh, outperform experts in prediction of future events. So for example, a platform like, like here, Metaculous aims to aggregate the information from many people, expertise and their predictive power into high quality forecasts. And this is particularly useful in cases in complex multivariable problems or in situations where we have lack of data um, and, or, or exact models. So super forecasting in that case can be used uh, to pick up early signals from pretty much anything you can imagine, be it in education or demographics or health, um, and as a way to use those signals to find the third horizon as a foresight signal. But I believe it can be used in other ways in the practice of grant making itself. A project that I've worked uh, with my former colleagues at the Center for Collective Intelligence Design at Nesta, we use super forecasting to um, harness the wisdom of Nesta employees and be able to predict risk organizational risk better. And by that, I mean risk related to finance and people and operations and legal risks. And we found that uh, through, through that approach, we can increase the accuracy in identifying and assessing organizational risk, but also we can uncover a blind spots because the way that method works is it allows multiple people with diverse perspectives to, 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 to participate. And finally, it also establishes a process that has more accountability for the, the management of risk. Um, the last uh, way is we've heard Amy mention that uh, about finding ecologies and not projects. And this is a project I'm currently working on. And the question is, okay, how do you do that well? Uh, so this is a project called Open Sustain Tech that I'm working with uh, Tobias Ausberger. Um, our premise is that if we want to move to a net zero world, we need an open ecosystem of data, software, and digital infrastructure. And while we see that broader trend towards open source technologies and projects, uh, and an increasing interest from funders to support these, there is no evidence about which projects can be considered critical digital infrastructure and where we have significant gaps. So what we've done is we've spent a year of crowdsourcing 1,200 actively developed open source software projects for sustainability, all the areas you can imagine. And now we're in the process of uh, analyzing um, the health and vibrancy of that ecosystem. Uh, we are using both qualitative data from intimate interviews with the developers, but also quantitative data from where the project lives on GitHub. And we are discovering, for example, areas where digital infrastructure is more mature, like energy systems modeling. We're discovering uh, new possibilities to connect various projects. And we're discovering general concerns uh, and, and challenges that the field has been uh, um, experiencing. So if, if you're interested in supporting a regenerative ecosystem for digital infrastructure for the planet, please do reach out. And um, so I just have fun. a final thought. Uh, I do believe we need to reach the drill from a range of intelligences and ways of knowing, be they artificial or learned knowledge or lived experience. Uh, and even also the capacity to imagine and act in the world. So the scale of the transition requires more depth and breadth and plurality to allow, to allow value to flow more, more abundantly. And I would uh, invite everyone to consider how they can gracefully utilize all the different kinds of knowledge to in their grant making process. Thank you so Super, much. Super, thank you. And finally, on to our last speaker for today, Annette from Dark Matter Labs will be sharing on how the creation of a many-to-many -many space of intention, accountability, and agreement works. 
Thanks, Thanks. Thanks Rose. Thank you. Um, I feel like I might have drawn the straw, short straw here because I can see Rose checking her... <laughs> at watch and everyone's sort of being a bit ready for lunch and I'm about to start talking about contracts um, <laughs> uh, but um, I'll try and make it nice and quick as a result um, so just to contextualize why I'm talking about and what type of contracts here um, We've heard a lot over the last couple of days from people speaking really beautifully about um, our need to move beyond not just funding communities to help them to like survive and um, like the structural violence of the systems that we're currently in um, and to create communities of care within them, but to enable a, an alternative system within which we can collectively thrive beyond the creation of those type of systems. And Imi was talking earlier about um, the role that philanthropy can play in you know, accelerating these deep demonstrations of new systems in place with powered by communities. Um, and uh, that's really a different space of, um, of funding that my, many of the systems that we currently have and many of the contracting systems that we currently have have been set up for. Um, so we've been really interested in um, what does it what, how do we contract and uh, into a space like this, um, particularly when ma many of the kind of funding systems still operate mainly on a what I would say a, a kind of one to many type uh, relationship? So you might have a funder that might. Um, you know, with legal advice, set up a contracting architecture um, to fund a variety of different fundees, and each of those might be slightly bespoke, but, you know, the, the contracting is set up from the, the funder. Um, and that creates then a series of relationships that go back and forth bilaterally between each of those fundees with the funder. Um, the sort of questions that, you know, get brought up when Imi's thinking about things like um, Deep's demonstration in place, these are like really, as you saw from the map that she shared, really deeply interconnected complex questions of multiple things that need to happen and reinforce each other to make change in a place like that. And so we need those learning and those feedback loops between the different actors in the system and therefore a different type of relationship and contracting space that we're setting up together in how we do this type of work. Um, and so we've called this here the many to many contract space. I mean, you know, there's various way collective, uh, multi-party, you, you could use various terms. Terms, but um, I think many people yesterday were speaking also about how we need an ecology of different types of finance to, to come together, uh, a plurality of different types of actors and intervention. So how can we create, build some of the, the themes that have been brought through in the last couple of days, you know, longer term, um, unrestricted, funding generously, uh, across a plurality of actors through multiple forms of finance and how do we actually execute that so I'm really interested in the like how that we I'm sure many are going to be coming out of this conference over the next two days thinking I'm so fired up how do I go about tomorrow thinking about how I start rewiring my processes my infrastructures and you know my contracts that are in the space um, and I mean I, 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 I'm going to keep it short, so I'm not going to go back into multiple, like, trying to talk through all the different pieces. There's loads of different pieces of governance that need rewiring to be able to start operating in a many-to-many -many space where actually you're coming together around a much broader set of intentions together. So you're not predetermining, okay, these are the actions that each of us are going to do in the next, and the outputs that we're going to create in the next year. Um, you know, many of the speakers were talking about the need for emergence and discovery. You know, we don't even, we're still discovering what even the public value is in a space like this. We need to be working it out as we go. Um, so how do we uh, put, put our funds collectively using tools like Open Collective, for example, into a broader space of intention um, and create sort of systemic governance practices that allow that to be governed with craft. Um, and I'm using the term craft here because uh, I think that there is, and, I, and you'll see on the slide, I put how can we do it in a way that reduces harm? Um, and I really want to focus on the fact that this is also a space of craft in doing this. And 
without care and attention to the way that the governance is set up, you know, you, you can open up spaces where you have deep plurality of actors who can, who, you know, where power can accumulate and where harm can, can exist. But we can also set these up in ways that really reinforce care. Um, and that's, that's a real craft. And luckily, I mean, there's in us looking at, at these kind of questions have found examples from all kinds of different places, um, cultures, communities, all kinds of different ways that people have been rewiring and thinking about systemic accountability. How do we measure? How do we think about pay? You know, who gets remunerated what? How can we set up a structure that reduces the, allows care to be centers, is equitable, and doesn't make it so burdensome that we're putting the burden on people in the space to try and work out all of these things you know you want to balance the agency with actually like not having to create everything from scratch so what we've been looking at um, is the contracting side of that. So we're, we're currently working with Joe Doran from Lang Kelly Chase um, and others in a, in a project that's called Beyond the Rules or kind of an exploration, if you will, called Beyond the Rules. Um, and we've been going through all of these different kind of governance pieces. We're working with lawyers to turn them into text that can then be kind of a plethora of existing options that people can riff off that have been thought about how they sit in the existing regulation um, just so kind of as to assist uh, and so that when we get to the point of trying to move into many to many spaces we've got things to build upon we can build upon existing crafts that already exist and really start to move quickly in the shifts that we've been talking about over the last couple of days and how we manifest those tomorrow uh, and the day after in our instruments in our contracts um, and I just really love this quote um, beautiful contracts their propositions are so attractive that both sides can't help but keep the promises. And I just want to say that like, when I'm talking about contracts here, I don't just mean like the piece of paper with the legal text. It's like the invitation to be in relation in a different way and the agreements that we make about how we're going to show up together in the space. And so when we're thinking about contracts, it's like, what is it? How are we making them irresistible to be part of as a different way of doing this work? Um, and. Uh, we, I just, one last thing that I want to leave with is that um, we've talked a lot about governance actually over the last couple of days, about how we need to rewire all kinds of different ways that we operate in the funding environment. And that governance and ways of transforming organizing goes beyond the needs of just funders as well. You know, like organizations, grassroots group movements, all of us need to be really having the space to work on how we organize and govern together. And at the moment, it's a massively, like woefully underfunded area. Um, so um, uh, Joe and I from um, Lankily Chase are trying to work on how we can get more resource into that space. Um, and we've got some plans there. So if anyone's interested, please come talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Contracting as a space for crafting care, who'd have thought it? Um, yesterday in the toilets, someone said to me, I feel like I need 10 minutes in a room on my own just to like breathe and absorb all this. And I feel like this session has been particularly a bit of a whistle stop tour. Uh, but obviously everything's been recorded and there's also a lot of useful links on the Notion site. So before I thank our speakers, I just wanted to end on a call for action. And firstly, I want you to think about how are you being experimental in your practices? And then secondly, how are you ensuring that your practices are commensurate with the scale, depth, and urgency of what's needed? And finally, how are you thinking and how are your politics manifested in your practice? Really think about that. What, is your, what are your practices saying about your values and your politics? I'd like to thank all the speakers and everything, everybody today for what's been a really packed session and for all the preparation that's gone into it and also for you all for um, taking part in this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we, we called this, uh, this conference New Frontiers, but I think the last session has been such a useful reminder that this is not year zero. And it also is a reminder of the pluralism that we've talked about over the last couple of days and just how much is going on uh, innovations in ph philanthropic practices. Um, 
We have got a final session uh, before lunchtime um, that is looking at progress and impact and risk and whether the ways that we currently think about those things might underweight or fail to weight the things that are important. Um, we've been promised by Indy, who is chairing it, Indy Johar uh, from Dark Matter Labs and Zero Zero, we've been promised a pacey, not ponderous session. So um, enjoy that and, um, and uh, we'll see you just before lunch. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, we're rapidly <coughs> sitting between you and lunch, and it's getting hungry. So we're going to try to make this pacey and fast. You've been sitting through, through some amazing days. And I think the kind of as we come to a close, and I think this is a privilege of being on the closing panel, is I think we need to start to look at what this means, but also the scale of what this implies. There's been lots of conversations here about scale, right? Lots of conversations. But let's put those things into context a little bit. We're almost certainly looking at a 3.5 degree future in terms of temperature rise. 3.5 degrees. Anyone who's talking about 1.5, it's not real. 3.5 on average will mean massive, massive temperature rises in cities and places around the world. In that context, we're talking about 1.2 billion people potentially being on the move. Syria was, what, 2 million people. This is bigger than anything that's happened, perhaps even world wars included. So when we start to talk about big, I'm not just talking like big relative to like big projects. I'm talking about big at the scale of society that's actually not been conceived of at this scale. When we start to talk about this, we also start to talk about something like 68% of S&P 100s, if you were to price social environmental costs, they're not viable anymore. People talk about degrowth, we're living in degrowth. Because the social environmental costs, if you price them in, there isn't the profit in the system. Most of the economy that you see around you is largely unviable in any of that future. So when we talk about big and the scale of the transition that we're in the middle of, we're talking about quite fundamental transitions in our theories of value, what we value, how we value, how we understand that world. And that also comes back to risk and opportunities. So when we talk about risk, unfortunately, most of our risk is allocated to capital and assets. It isn't allocated to futures. What is our risk to the people that we're murdering into the future, which is literally what we're doing right now? Our current economy is at war with the future. And it's almost certainly at war with many people in the present. So in that scale, what it, risk to whom? And in that scale, value to whom? Opportunity to whom? I think these are fundamental questions. And I suppose one of the key points, I think, in this conversation that we're going to have in this panel and as part of this discussion is how do we start to think about this in a really radically different way? Because unfortunately, the future is massively entangled, or fortunately. It is indivisible. Much of those conversations are indivisible because our futures are massively entangled in terms of how we deal with some of these risks. So we're going to talk about fundamental transition. And there, in that context, what is the role of philanthropy, but what is the role of capital in that transition, I think, becomes really important. And what's the scale of that? So I suppose it is in that context. I'm going to start with Julio and really talk about, get your perspective on some of the kind of organizational ideas of adopting to risk and I think and also uncertainty right this future is massively uncertain in a complex world how do we build the organizations to deal with this scale of transition but also what's the organizational structures behind that uh, <laughs> I had the answer to that. <laughs> yeah exactly uh, well at least for us uh, I work for UNDP uh, so obviously for us we are a big bureaucracy and part of the discussion has been to start actually distinguishing between risk and uncertainty, right? So uh, risk is a talk that is extremely important. Uh, the questions that you're asking are fundamental, but it also often creates a sense of false certainty. Uh, artifacts of certainty like dashboards, metrics, and all these other things that almost feel like you can control uh, risk in a world that is actually fundamentally uncertain. And the skills that we need for uncertainty are actually quite different 
complementary, equally important to the skills that we need for risk. And so how do you actually even start a conversation on this when obviously we have to all our risk frameworks and there's lots of certainty attached to it and the feeling that actually this provides a sense of comfort to any good bureaucrat to say we have solid risk frameworks where actually the world that you're describing is one of increasing uncertainty. So we tried a number of different uh, approaches to do it, uh, ranging from having our staff, you know, our management, uh, spending days with a magician to understand actually what mm -hmm. happens to live in a world of improvisation and having to work in a very different type of way of doing things. So we design programs uh, to put them through alternative <coughs> reality simulations where actually we are in, uh, faced with an increasing level of uncertainty in a real world scenario playing games with actually real mayors, real cities around the world. So that has been a little bit of an opening. Um, but obviously, uh, this requires much, much harder rewiring. And I think most of uh, speakers for the last couple of days have talked about actually how projects, the way we think about it, are part of a problem. They're part of a problem of not being able to actually design interventions that are commensurate and coherent to the nature of the challenges that we're doing. So how do you start a conversation of going beyond projects in an organization, but it's statute, legally, we have to do projects. That's the only way we get money or can disburse money to say, if we want to organize ourselves in a way that is coherent to this type of risks, guess what? Two years or five years funding, uh, the typical type of funding that we can do, uh, this is not going to cut it. Uh, we tend to project our internal taxonomy to problems. Uh, and which means that climate is assigned to the environmental unit, and by doing that, you already frame the problem in a particular way, which prevents you to actually understand what are potential solutions. How do you organize financial instruments that actually know, you know, so how do we get away from this process where when you write a project proposal, you know, the funder knows, the government we work for, that we cannot say that we are going to deliver exactly a workshop in November 2023 and this is going to actually, actually really help climate change. We know this is not the case. They know it's not the case. How do we actually generate a conversation to move it differently? So we'll try to open up a space to actually say, can we redesign, for example, our uh, way in which we manage the risk in the projects so that it is not someone typically at the beginning when we design the project it's always attention on risk and then as we implement depending on how solid the monitoring and evaluation system is well you know you know but anyway we're forced to then report and everything then needs to start looking like a success because this is what the machinery tends to want to do it right so how do we change that relationship to say well can we actually jointly manage the risks and can we actually have the risks defined by the system together with the system that we are operating in so that we actually constantly adapt rather than actually saying we need to report results and successes on a regular basis. So we have a, a sandbox where we're trying to do this on changing the way we do monitoring and evaluation. We're trying to design a, a financial instrument that would allow us to commit to a place and the topic in the long term mm -hmm. under the assumption that circumstances will change unexpectedly and we actually will need to be able to uh, adapt the financing based on what we are learning as we work with these type of complex issues. So all of this is very hard rewiring uh, of how we think about projects, programming, monitoring and evaluation, human resources, etc. So I need just to say we are not uh, you know, the best equipped organization to do it in many different places. So it's an ongoing journey, uh, and this is the journey that we just started. Julia, thank you. And I think that builds up two really important points. There's uncertainty in the now of what needs to be done, but there's still what I would call long-term thinking, because we know some of the strategic issues on the table, whether it's food baskets becoming unstable at one and a half degrees. We need to change our food basket, the energy profile that we need to fundamentally change. So there's longitudinal sort of long-term plays whilst building the capacity to deal with uncertainty in the now. And that, that's quite different from most program designs, which are fixed capital program designs with fixed outcome mechanisms. So how do you allocate from a more facility framework rather than a fund framework, which is cap models? So this starts to open up some really interesting questions. Kerry, maybe if I just come straight to yeah. you on this in terms of actually, I'm gonna bring both words, value and valuation. Yeah. 
<laughs> into that theory of uncertainty, which is the short-term uncertainty with longitudinal outcomes? I think, um, so I'm an evaluation practitioner um, and I've been um, part of the hardwiring that's the problem for about 20 years doing sort of commissioning <laughs> of evaluation and delivery of evaluation both in-house at foundations and, and you know, as a consultant. And I have exactly the same phrase in my notes, it's not cutting it anymore. Like, we know as we're doing the work, as we're in a room with people trying to fill in the boxes and the arrows and the theory of change and the, to tell me your outcomes, you can feel it. Like, this makes no sense to anybody, it's not useful to anybody, nobody wants to be doing it, we're all miserable. It's <laughs> like, you know, like, but we are, right? Like, I, it's, I know it's not working, you know it's not working. It's, and then you, you get to a point where you have got some really great data and some great insight and as the evaluator you're in this really privileged position of, of seeing things from lots of different perspectives but the interim report's not due for two months and there's no mechanism to get any of this learning into a program and you know there's no you know unless you're going to work for free and really beg someone to let you work for free because it's just not designed that way but they might be interested in your recommendations in a year's time when the program's finished <laughs> so right this 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 isn't working um so I'll, over the last sort of couple of years rather than stay with this sort of cynical anger I've started digging around to think you know what are the <laughs> other ideas and practices are there out there and that's led me to the work of um, people like Jewel Lynn and Hallie Preskill, Michael Quinn Patton, the Equitable Evaluation Initiative. I think it's important to get these names out there because otherwise it's like I'm inventing something and it's been going on for years by others. CCAN in this country, Helen Wilkinson and the work they did on the Magenta Book Supplement on Complexity and Evaluation. There's stuff happening out there and what their practice is grappling with is the difference between the need of innovative, complex, transitional work that's trying to attend to inclusivity and equity and racial justice and what is provided by the dominant models of evaluation and valuing things. And evaluation is often described as having grown up in the projects, particularly in America, you know, because it, it existed to support these test and prove models. So some centralised decision-making process could allocate funds and make decisions about rolling or scaling up, right? Which comes back to Luan's, Luan's point earlier about you know you need different different ideas of what scale is, um, and, and that's not that's not what we need. So based on my journey so far from looking at this stuff, there's two things I want to say to start today. And the first is we need to expand the role for evaluation of what evaluation is. And I'm using the word expand very deliberately there. I'm not saying replace the role for evaluation. So you're expanding from determining value to developing value, from shif shifting sort of from, you know, how well are we doing to what should we do next and bringing to bear the sort of the skills and the methods we have as evaluators to helping do the work at the pace and scale it needs, needs to be happening. Um, and through that expansion, I think you're, you're really recognising that as evaluators, you become part of the work. You're not observers of the work. It fundamentally changes the nature of that role and the way you work as part of the team and as part of the doing of the work. And the nature of accountability changes. So you're not judging and reporting on outcomes that I sort of gather up and present to the funder away, far away from where the work is happening. I, you know, I'm supporting the direction that the work takes and, and providing an account of why it's unfolding the way it is, which is a useful account and is a form of accountability, but is also in service to the work as it's happening to the stewardship of the work. Um, and I think, you know, one, like if I give a practical example of that, Emily Gates in her work for the Ripple Foundation evaluating their Rethink Health initiative talks about how their theory of change wasn't an account of, you know, how does this initiative change the system to change the outcomes, but it was a developmental theory of systems change. It was describing for the people doing the work, you know, how does the system look? Not so someone could say, well, it's, you know, it's shifted that much, and you know, I'm really out and judge how much by, but so they knew what to do in terms of next steps. And the second point I want to make is we need to start making really deliberate choices about the role for evaluation. And part of that is knowing what there is to choose from. You know, there is so much more to evaluation than outcomes and impact. There's over 100 different approaches. If you look at Michael Quinn Patton's YouTube channel, there's some really good, pithy, insightful videos on that and the tensions and things that have led to that position. 
And that's before we even start imagining what evaluation could be and the way we value things could be if you combine our skills with you know, all of the different disciplines out there, all of the things we've heard from today, the lived experience, the systems expertise, the complexity science. Um, but the most important part of that is the word deliberate. Right? You have to make conscious, intentional choices about the role that evaluation is going to play. We can't just keep marching unconsciously into sort of using this dominant model that we've always used because we haven't stopped to think about you know, whether that's useful or what that means or what that says about the way our organisations work. And so that means taking time to sort of explore you know, why do we do the things we do? You asking questions about what is it, what are the values and assumptions that underpin what is valuable to us, who is us in that sentence? How do we define rigor? What is it to know something? Always, if you're lost in evaluation, you stop and you say, what is it to know something in this context from this perspective? You know, what have we learned? And who gets to decide that? Who gets to decide this is stamped as a learning or as evidence to be shown to the world? And who is this evaluation for? How will it be practically useful for them? This is what should be guiding the way we, we use evaluation for this work. And how are these choices aligned you know, with the anti-racist work and the ambitions we have about a fair world? Like, it, it, are these things lining up? And I think just circling back to that point about risk, you know, it's really important to you can't use evaluation to make you feel a greater sense of security about new work that you're doing, right? You can't try and do experimental new transitional work and then do the same old evaluation because that, it's like a safety blanket. I've got my theory of change, so I know what to say to the trustees and it feels secure and I don't feel as nervous about it. Because if you do that, you're literally making the work harder to do. Kerry, can I just sort of... I hear you. <laughs> I, the word evaluation feels problematic, actually, um, because it still structures the theory of power in its language and its positioning. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether it might be time to let go of the word to adopt the developmental perspective, the learning developmental perspective that you're putting forward. Yeah. I, I wonder whether the word is itself embodying some historic theory of power and control, which actually we, we might want to get rid of. Because in a complex and tangled world, the evaluation is multi-perspectival, has to be, and it won't be, it'll be a different format. Like, I wonder whether some of our language and taxonomy that we're using as governance theories are almost have to evolve in order to free us up to be able to see things differently. Yeah, I, I think that there's, I think personally for me, you know, the language doesn't matter. The docu you know, the structure mm. of the thing that you fit, none of that matters. What you need is critical thinking, time and space for reflective practice. I think a lot of the value that evaluation, learning, whatever you call it, is, is actually just permission to have a space to do the kind of deep thinking, the inquisitive, you know, surfacing of implicit assumptions that needs to happen. Um, and, and helping other people and do that. Right? Well, that's what I mean, doing that yeah. for people, holding the space, basically, yeah. for others. And that's, yeah. the, that's the greatest value that I think you bring. Um, and, I, and I, you know, you, you've noticed in job titles and tenders and things for a long time, the word learning comes up. There's, you never see evaluation. You have sort of learning, knowledge and learning, you know, impact and learning. Um, but there's definitely an awareness of that. And, and all of the language is problematic. Think, you know, like, don't go into something and start with, let's do our theory of change. It's a disastrous way to start anything, you yeah. know. Um, you're telling stories about your work. You're trying to tell credible stories and challenge yourselves with data from all different sources, data in the widest sense of what that word could mean mm. about, uh, you know, how to make your story more successful. And that's, that's all it is, really, yeah. you know. I yeah, appreciate that. Matu, um, so you've been, in terms of the kind of scale of the conversation and what we're facing, impact investing, its contribution maybe to that, and also how do you understand risk into that framework? Because, you know, as we say, it, risk is often accounted to the kind of capital holders. Yeah. Um, and maybe there's loads of people discounted off that risk profile. Right? 
Yeah, well, I think when we think about impact investing, we have to acknowledge it's a drop in the bucket, right? If you were in the finance of ecology, uh, ecology of finance panel yesterday, Kieran Boyle did an exercise where he asked three people to stand up and it's, he said, these three people represent all of the assets of all of the foundations that are doing impact investing. And so we really need to use impact investing as a demonstrative model to convince larger capital markets to start putting their money where their mouth is. Um, and one of the things that we grapple with a lot at the fund that I'm running, again, a very small drop in the bucket, is what is the risk of not doing something and how do we price that into the cost of capital and the, the way we make investments? And we are very easily able to articulate the risk of not doing something when it comes to climate. You talked about a 3.5 degree increase and all of the, the swaths of destruction that will happen if we don't meet that. Well, we aren't having a conversation of what is the risk of not doing something when it comes to social inequality and social justice. And for me, it kind of comes into twofold. One is this risk of not doing something when it comes to social inequality is um, resilience. And we saw it in the pandemic, right? And where I'm from in Canada, the government, private investors didn't put any enough investment and enough emphasis on the health investments into black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities here, nor into hospital beds in the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit and they were severely underprepared. And along with Canada and the rest of the world, financial markets tumbled and no one took a view on what was the risk of not investing into healthcare and in building that resilience in communities that we don't, we have already historically underinvested in it when it comes to to colonization um, and racism and social justice. Um, and then the second thing that I would urge a lot of impact investors and finance professionals to think about that I haven't seen a conversation on is, what is the cost of capital and what is the cost of rebuilding something when our under, under investment in a system makes it break? How much money and how much, how many people do we have to bring around the table and, and what is the value of, of the human lives that we're affecting, well, we need to bring, we need to build up everything that we've underinvested in. Um, it's, it's a conversation that isn't, isn't happening enough. And when we usually think about these risks, it means an increase in the cost of capital, especially to a lot of the investors that we're working with. But should we, talking, should we be talking about decreasing the cost of capital when we price in the risks of things that aren't happening? No, I think, I, I, well, it's a really good point. And many, one of the things that it throws up, though, is these risks are aggregative risks, right? Yeah. They're not individual fund risks, they're societal risks. So that means there, are, there need to be societal mechanisms to price those risks differently for different funds who are either taking it on board or not. Is there a capital gains tax, you know, equivalently to, to dealing with that? Because these are aggregative formats, they're yeah. not individual. I don't even think we're there yet. Yeah. We, we haven't even talked about how we change the accounting systems that we're working in to price in social value and environmental value and the risk of not doing something. I think if we talk about taxes and other societal mechanisms, we really need to get the hardwiring right before we even start thinking about how we engage government, pension funds, which hold a large substantial value of assets. And so one thing that's kind of, as we start to say, nature-based solutions, large-scale solutions that are coming in, impact investors move into that. that. As we start to convert nature from a resource, and in, certainly in our economy from a resource to an asset, it means that the cost of nature will increase. Mm. And, and thereby has an implication for large-scale inflation of goods and prices. How do you see this discourse? And the role of, is this, is this where we want to go? It's where we need to go. I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done on the institutions that define cost of capital yeah. and inflation. We are still speaking in languages that are meant for today, that are meant for the past. And we don't have the words in the regulatory bodies, in the governments, in the people that make decisions on investment committees to start thinking about what a 
increase in the cost of nature means for everyone. Yeah, and, and I, th I think one of the reasons I think this panel is important is when you start to price those risks in. And we are going to see a whole new, I hate the word, I don't have another word, market. Yeah. Um, because I don't think it is a market, but let's use that word because it has sort of colloquial understanding. St it has fundamental implications for society. And what's the role of philanthropy in creating these contexts? And why, how do we justly want to create them? I think are big open questions. But this also opens us up into a wider conversation. And I think one of the things I've personally been frustrated by is I often get accused of sitting in rooms like this and going, wow, it's great you're having this conversation. Nobody on the ground is going to understand it. Hmm. And I hate it. Hate it at a point of interest. And part of the kind of fun of yesterday being Birmingham was that actually we could have this conversation on the ground with neighbours who were coming up and saying, thank you for having this conversation because it, f it feels real to me. Right? So... There's an interesting conversation about how do we take these, these conversations and have them diagonally and have them inclusively, but into that future. How do we talk about this as a new knowledge? Because this isn't a decision that we can make, but it's a societal conversation. Um, thanks for that question, Indy, and, and to all of you. Um, and I'm going to come to it as this isn't a new conversation right. for any of our communities. Yeah. Our communities have borne the risks of colonial capitalism for the last 400 years. And the abyss that we're on, looking straight into at this moment, is an abyss that is the success of capitalism, not the failure of it. Mm. And so for us to think about new vocabularies and language, and I agree with you, Mathu, we do need to, is also to have to reframe mm. what we're in search of and who with and who from. So um, as part of a feminist collective called Whose Knowledge that centers the leadership, the design, the imaginations, and the knowledges of the so-called marginalized communities of the world, historically and ongoing. Um, and we like to remind everyone, as people have across the last two days, that we are the minoritized majority of the world. Um, most of us do not look like anyone in this room. And um, the risks of a two-degree world are already being born. This is not a future, this is a present. It has been a past. And so how do we look at the stretch of colonial capitalism? And I put those two words very meaningfully and intentionally together, because often we talk about colonization on the one hand, and we talk about capitalism on the other. They are very much a stretch of the same historical processes. Race was a construct to justify colonization. Capital comes out of the resources that were extracted from our peoples, our lands, our bodies, um, and our memories, and our ways of knowing and doing. And that is the empire that continues to be driving capital today. Right, so when I think of it, from very clear numbers perspectives as a lapsed economist. Um, a feminist economist, Utsa Nayak, in 2018, did a, 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 a projection of how much was taken out of India during the 250 years of British rule, and that was $45 trillion. $45 trillion. The GDP of Britain in 2018 was close to $45 trillion. Um, if we think about the fact that, that that's the money just out of India, and we look at the rest of the empire, we look at the rest of the colonizing powers, then we think about the fact that Wakanda is not a lovely Afro-future, it was a possible African past, mm. right? Um, and then I look at my country again, and it's present day fascism and authoritarianism, and the killing and uh, slow genocide of Dalit, indigenous, and Muslim peoples. And I think about the fact that tech capital, the big five, will say nothing to my government because India is its largest market. So colonial capitalism prioritizes, as you said, Indy, who values what, right? So if we have to create 
new vocabularies. Let's do it, as the Maori say beautifully, walking into the future backwards. Let's look at where we've come from. Let's look at what we've learned from our communities and our movements already, who have been living these lives. We sit in a place of privilege because this abyss is opening up and yawning at our feet now, while it already has been for so long. Ken Serubiva, leader of the Ogoni people in Nigeria, was assassinated for his resistance and his people's resistance to Shell. Today, we might be giving him the Nobel Prize for Peace. What has changed in these 30 years? Not the experiences of those on the ground, not the experiences of those on the streets, not the experiences of those in different communities. It is literally the understanding of those of us in the room and in other privileged spaces to recognize that the abyss is going to take us all. So that's the way in which I think when we think about whose knowledge is centered, it isn't to say that we are decentering everyone else or not including everyone else. But let's be clear, the imaginations, if we can call them imaginations, of those who brought us to the abyss are not going to be the imaginations that get us out of here. Mm. And so what happens when we look at markets the way that they were as, you know, I find it really am amusing when finance capital um, talks about emerging markets and <laughs> looks at Asia and Africa and Latin America and I'm like, well, these are the oldest markets in the world, yeah. right? So what, what's emerging about them? What's emerging is the values that capitalism places in atomic individuals, in de in disembedding social relationships, in disembedding the values that these markets of exchange, of trust, of reciprocity have always had. And this is not to romanticize the pre-colonial past. There are a great many things about the pre-colonial past we don't want to live with, but there is a sense of what it is to recognize that these imaginations are not imaginations of the future, they're imaginations of the past and of the present. They're imagine, ima, imaginations of resilience. We have to imagine in order to survive. And if we were in a world where the risk was not ours to bear, because let's be clear, the risk is the risk of those who are most marginalized, then, what would our imaginations provide? What would the imaginations of the Zapatista provide? What would the imaginations of the Ogoni people provide? Or thinking about Silicon Valley, what would the imaginations of the Lysian Ohlone people who, whose territory yeah. Silicon Valley sits on, what would their internet look like? Yeah. Uh, can I just... I think just to one thing on this is that, is risk even the right word mm. in that conversation? Which is that when you're facing the abyss, I, I think there's a different language that we need there because I think this is not something that you mitigate. It's, it's a tsunami of problems. Like, yeah. I wonder whether we've again adopted, just for us as a panel to be itself, we've adopted language of finance, which is about allocation yeah. and possibility, yeah. when actually when you're the victim of 45 degrees centigrade, yeah. that's not a risk. Yeah. That's, that's termination in many ways and the destruction of possibility. Of that. I, I think it's a really good point. I think. Here's where I find risk useful and where I don't find yeah. it useful. Um, many of our communities remind us that humans are the youngest species in the world. Mm. Look at how arrogant we are, right? <laughs> um, we're the youngest species in the world and we have created this moment of um, catastroph catastrophic risk to all of us and to this planet we're on. So risk is not, I think, a useful word when we think about the ways in which interconnected sentience is facing the abyss. Um, and much of that sentience, not for its own, not through its own agency, because 
humans have agency of a particular kind that other forms mm -hmm. of life don't. Um, here's where I do think risk is the right word. It's the right word when we think about the intimate conversations we have to have with ourselves and each other in order to change and transform. As a means of empathy, right? Be it is about, it's not just about empathy, it's about taking the risk to recognize that we're at the abyss, we're looking in, we are interconnected, and as many others said beautifully earlier this morning, either lean in and recognize, and I'm using lean in in this case with scare quotes, <laughs> lean into the abyss and realize we're on that precipice and many others are already sliding down, or get out of the way. And so part of it is to recognize that, and I speak as someone who is both oppressor and oppressed. I'm not here in a righteous space of binaries. It's not an us and them conversation. I come from India. I am part of the dominant castes. My ancestors have been oppressors for centuries and millennia. We can teach you a thing or two about oppression. <laughs> um, however, we are interconnected in a way that we cannot ignore. And therefore, the risk is have the conversations that you need to have to say, why is it that black and brown bodies and minds and imaginations, why do we know our histories of colonization? Why do we know the political economies of capitalism exactly as you said, Indy? Without using fancy words, we know what it means to not be able to go to a market and buy the things we need to buy for our kids, right? Where are the conversations you've had in your homes with your children, with your parents, with your grandparents about the ways the histories of colonization and capitalism have benefited you? And what do we do about it? That is the risk we all need to take. However, the meta interlocking crises, I don't think the word risk, as you say, is <laughs> the right word at all. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep us to time to um thank you to this brilliant panel thank you to every other speaker that was here before us because we stood on your great shoulders i i think you've heard from this panel i suppose my number one request for people in this room i think the moment in the next thousand days thousand days not 10 years thousand days is an invitation to be your biggest self together. And I think we're going to have to change things fundamentally together in ways that have never been discussed before. And this isn't going to be done by solving one thing in one part of the world. I genuinely think this is a planetary conversation at a scale and order that I think we've never done before as a, as a global thing. We won't be able to solve it in one part of the world and imagine we'll be okay. And that means it, re it requires us to recognize our entanglement. And it needs us to operate at the scale of our entanglement. And it needs us to reimagine all the boring bureaucracies that we borrowed for an industrial world, which are no longer fit for purpose to operate in that world. I think one of the big powers of philanthropy, and I just want to say this, is that you can articulate public goods that are not yet even been imagined. Movements have understood public value before it, states have ever understood it. Democracy was built by the discovery of new public value and the articulation and building the movements of public value in many formats. You're going to have to discover new public goods and public value, billions of people into the future. The microchip that you have in your phones is a function of 70 billion human lives worth. Of. So how do you build the space for the new public goods and the new public commons in a way that's not been imagined in the people that aren't in the room? That's not a request for empathy. It's a request for actually our genuine ability to avoid the abyss that we're facing. And I think, as it was rightly said, I think the abyss is no longer for some parts of the population. I think the abyss is for all of us, because I don't think we survive this without all of us surviving it. And I think that is a real problem. That defines the scale of the challenge. And, you know, 
and I'll say this, the reason why I say that last point it can sound very melodramatic, but the reality is if you speak to people, you talk about the rise of war, the rise of terrorism, the rise of the breakdown in every level system, food, energy systems, there is no convenient collapse.